What is your Halloween when you're not playing? What do you do for Halloween? That depends what the Friend options are. are. It's actually pretty funny. Kids are scared to come to my house on Halloween. <laughs> 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 I buy candy and they won't come in the gate. They mm -hmm. just stand outside and then they go, uh-uh. <laughs> So before we devour the delectable Danish that is Danzig, let's strap on the bib and lay down a few ground rules. Number one, this episode is devoted to the complete discography of Danzig and Danzig alone. Not the Misfits, who I happen to think are shit anyways. Not Glenn Danzig, and as much as I love them and as important as they are to the band's formation, not Sam Hain either. If it ain't a Danzig album, I ain't reviewing it, so consider that a preemptive fuck you to the witless, chest-slapping simps inquiring as to why the Black Arias are not included. And number two, I do not review compilations or live albums. No Thrall Demon Sweat Live, no Lost Tracks of Danzig, spectacular though both those releases may in fact be. Without further delay, let's strap on the skull belt buckle and black jeans so tight they bond with our legs on the subatomic level and document the devastation that is Danzig. Because we all have a little twist of cane. And we all know if you start letting that little twist of cane into your heart, well, then it'll split you down the middle and you'll come alive. And pretty soon there'll be blood pouring out of people's heads like a crimson highway. To quote Danzig. After pioneering in the realms of punk rock, speed, and even black metal with Samhain, upon the establishment of Danzig, it was time to get back to the roots, not just of Glenn Danzig or guitarist John Christ's influences, but to the very roots of rock and metal itself, with Guns N' Roses kicking off a renewed appreciation for bands like Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple igniting an industry-wide 70s hard rock renaissance in the process, Danzig confined themselves to the darker climes of early Black Sabbath and The Doors, with Glem's omnipresent appreciation for the king, Elvis Presley, in full effect as always. The end result was arguably the single most genuine expression of balls-out heavy metal thunder to hit the music industry in nearly 15 years. Equal parts blues, 50s rock and roll, and doom metal. Nothing in 1980 sounded like Danzig, including his previous bands. This was the sound of an artist attaining full musical maturity and somehow managing to perfect his own art motherfucking instantaneously. But perhaps the most unsung hero of classic Danzig owns the ass occupying the producer's chair on the first four records, the remorseless Rick Rubin. And can I just state for the purposes of public record that this man gets way too much fucking shit from the poser posse. Wah, there's audio clipping. Wah, you can hear the amps hissing. Wah, ear fatigue. Wah, the rattling speakers dislodge my retainer. Draw a dick, it's fucking heavy metal. You know what else has audio clipping? A fuck of a lot of your favorite albums. Shit from the 60s and 70s that forms the goddamn bedrock upon which all modern metal is built. This motherfucker produced the first four classic Danzig records, arguably the finest work of Johnny Cash's legendary career, and the first decent records Metallica and Black Sabbath have recorded in 10 fucking years at least. I think we can cut him some slack for subpar recording quality in heavy metal, a genre that was goddamn built on subpar audio quality. But there's nothing subpar about the standout track, the scorching salutation to Sabbath, Am I Demon? Am I And by salutation, I mean near plagiarism. This album is a rarity, a debut album that seems to know exactly what it is. Maybe it's a product of having slaved away with two bands before finally landing the deal with Def Jam, but whatever it is, Danzig One is one of the finest metal albums of the 1980s. Sadly, 
far too many fuckwads take one look at the track listing with anthems like, you know, Mother, M.I. Demon, and Twist of Cain, they pick this record up and proceed to willfully ignore the remainder of Danzig's discography. As you'll soon learn, those ear-biting dipshits are unwittingly depriving themselves of arguably the most consistently excellent collection of metal ever released in the musical desert that was the early 1990s. Fucking next! The Lost Books of Bible tells you a lot of stuff that they omitted from the Bible. All original chapters of the Bible which were excised. Another time when Lord Jesus was coming home in the evening with Joseph, he met a boy who ran so hard against him that he threw him down. To whom the Lord Jesus said, As thou hast thrown me down, so shalt thou fall, for nor ever rise. And at that moment the boy fell down and died. Jesus. four classic Danzig records all seem to excel at what are the four musical modes of vintage Danzig. Whereas the first album was characterized by a hookier, more hard rock oriented sound derived from the 1970s, Danzig 3 is more somber, atmospheric doom metal, and Danzig 4 darker still with gradual infusion of gothic and industrial metal. But Danzig 2, on the other hand, is full-blown blues metal back to front. Danzig 1, for all its virtues, was far from a perfect album. Even its standouts like the smash hit Mother wouldn't actually become said smash hit until it was re-recorded on Thrall Demon Sweat Live with a punchier production quality, not to mention raw energy that the inaugural Danzig album lacked somewhat. 1990's Danzig 2 would ameliorate each and every one of those faults. This album is a masterpiece, opening up with its strongest track and never once falling off in quality throughout Lucifuge, however the fuck you pronounce that, is just motherfucking merciless. And Lucifer's dangling dick would a vocal performance. Glenn Danzig's voice has never been stronger, more soulful, imbued with more controlled fury. Never mind Danzig's discography, this is one of the finest vocal performances in the history of metal. When I say masterpiece, I motherfucking mean it. Even the somewhat sappy Roy Orbison-inspired ballad Blood and Tears is elevated by the mind-blowing vocal performance of Glenn Danzig with the undeniably talented Chuck Biscuits laying down blistering Mitch Mitchell-type percussive aggression. Bassist Erie Vaughn, of course, filling out the band's newly discovered bottom end and guitarist John Christ cementing his position as easily the most underrated axe man in all of metal. He isn't fucking alone, either. You need Danzig fucking two. Why do, why do you feel such an affinity towards uh, male vocalists? I mean, like really classic male vocalists like Roy Orbison and Elvis. Because they could sing. Yeah. Is that how you'd like to be remembered as like a classic as a male vocalist? vocalist? Uh, well, that wouldn't be bad. Um, it's it's kind of a drag always being compared to dead people. <laughs> Danzig 2, and even before Enduring, famed producer Rick Rubin was just over fucking worked. Take a look at this cat's discography from the time, if you have a spare weekend, that is. At the same time he was cutting the uncontested classic that is Danzig 2, Def Jam had this bastard cranking out everything from hip-hop to dance to a motherfucking comedy record. Assuming you feel comfortable describing Andrew Dice Clay as comedy. By 1993, his schedule was taking its toll, exacerbated further by newly emerging creative differences with Glenn Danzig and other members of the band. As such, while Rick Rubin's name is still front and center on the album credits, the third Danzig effort was effectively written and produced by Glenn Danzig himself. The result? Danzig 3, How the Gods Kill, easily the band's most depressive, sludgy, 70s doom metal effort to date, an uncompromising 
ending love letter to Black Sabbath with just a twist of 80s goth rock. You know, if goth rock had a dick. Best track, well, while many other songs can boast some of the most striking dynamics of the band's discography, my vote would have to go to a hellish headbanger by the name of Do You Wear the Mark? has one downside, it's that nearly five years of unremitting touring had actually begun to chip away at Danzig's formerly sterling vocal cords. In lieu of pulling back on his trademark werewolf howl, Glenn Danzig made possibly the single goofiest artistic choice possible, and thus, Glenn Danzig opted to briefly share vocal duties with a beloved Sesame Street character. <laughs> C is for Cookie, it's good enough for Danzig. Danzig 3, arguably the maturation of Glenn Danzig as a songwriter, even as the band itself slowly began to disintegrate. They say pressure makes a diamond, so crack open this jewel case, chuck Danzig 3 in the stereo, and brace for 10 tracks of 47 karat kick ass. Next! Uh, so what happened to uh, Chuck? Uh, Why did he leave? He wasn't happy. <laughs> Didn't want like the way things were going, you know? Yeah. Things go and they change, and you either stay or you don't. And the relationship is over. As we poured over as many details as can conceivably be sandwiched into one of these little mini-reviews, one thing I haven't yet mentioned about the first three Danzig records is that for however successful they are at present, secure as they are in their immutable classic status, none of them were initially all that successful. The first record, now considered the band's masterpiece, wasn't even in the Billboard's Top 100, and Danzig 2 barely cracked the Top 50. It wasn't until after Thrall Demon Sweat Live's release in 93, and the sudden unexplained explosion of the live music video for Mother, that Danzig 3 finally managed to crack the top 30 with each of the previous three albums following soon after. As the mid-90s reared its vapid, flannel-bedecked head, Danzig found themselves in the unfamiliar position of releasing an album that the public at large were genuinely in danger of actually looking forward to. For the first time ever, whether they liked it or not, they had a standard to match. And then Danzig 4 dropped. Look, there's some superb shit on Danzig 4, featuring some of the thickest atmospherics in their motherfucking catalog, but in retrospect, it's not hard to see why the record-buying public that had just been freshly introduced to the band through catchy, fist-pumping anthems like Mother lost interest after being immediately handed motherfucking this. It's like the Beatles following up Hold My Hand with Antichrist Superstar, but when Danzig 4 hits all cylinders, its utterly unique blend of doom metal, blues, and fleeting hits hints of industrial renders some truly haunting gems like the infectious I don't mind the pain. If you call our name, rest the show, But the lowlights are beyond low. They're playing limbo at the base of the Mariana Trench, like the utter shitpiled do-nothing collective of pseudo-industrial Halloween noises known as sadistical. I mean, you made a music video for this? Seriously? Note to Glenn, Godflesh already exists. Not one carbon-based cunt on this planet was pining for a B-grade version of them. Perhaps spurred by his sudden hard-left musical turn, the classic lineup of Danzig promptly scattered to the four winds, with drummer Chuck biscuits splitting even before the album dropped, leading Danzig to recruit habitual replacement drummer Joey Castillo. Compounding the calamity matters between Glenn Danzig and Rick Rubin at last came to a forehead, with Glenn firing accusations of unpaid royalties and lack of label support, Danzig and Def Jam would ultimately part ways in perpetuity. Its dubious legacy aside, Danzig 4 remains a dark, visionary masterpiece that stands utterly apart from anything else in the Danzig catalog. Which is more than you can say for what came fucking next. The mid 
1990s stood host to many radical new developments, all of which seemed to fall into one of two categories. The insufferably politically correct, or the unremittingly boring, and all too often a lethal cocktail of the two. Falling down on the latter end of the descriptor scale was the ill-fated industrial metal movement of the mid-90s that subsisted until... Far too recently, to paraphrase, industrial is the future, as the industrial death wagon made its rounds through what was left of the music business, all too many once great acts were eager to hop aboard. Do not doubt me when I tell you that every single one of them did so better than dancing. Alice Cooper's Brutal Planet is a darksome masterpiece, and Dragon Town ain't far behind. Wasp's Kill Fuck Die album is a tour de force when Motley Crue recorded Generation Swat. Okay, point taken, but Glenn Danzig didn't jump on the money wagon. He dove, head first, like he'd been sucker punched by a 500-pound douchebag from a shitty hardcore band that never went anywhere and ran the fuck away before he hit the ground. Which isn't to say that every moment of Danzig 5 is the sound of a desperate artist's fumbling attempt to remain current, as evidenced by easily one of the most unique and credible covers of a Black Sabbath song ever recorded, a standout from Paranoid named Hand of Doom. <laughs> Worst track? Everything the fuck else. And I do mean everything. Every note, every note after that note, every moment of silence between tracks, the cover art, the producer, the Disney record label, the third cousin of the sweatshop dipshit in Flies on Your Face Liberia that pressed the fucking disc, it all, without exception, sucks. Oh, but the leading tower of turd is the somnolent sacrifice, which is best described as what middle-aged TV producers play in the background of CSI episodes to simulate the experience of partying at a goth club. I wanna bring you I want you to feel alive Slick, I've had the misfortune of being in a goth club. You want to simulate the experience? Try being sandwiched between an asexual adolescent waif and a 300-pound womanity in a corset that is audibly begging for its life as rolls of lily-white armpit fat spill the fuck over like melted motherfucking candle wax, breathing a briny blend of cheap incense, aquanet, and butthole. I don't give a fuck if you hand-weave that fishnet top out of adamantium elevator cable. The Hoover Dam ain't keeping those shoulder boulders from sliding off the corset cliff and flattening the fuck out a piggy. Now bear with me, Rageaholics, because I'm about to try something. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. And Danzig 5 eats a dick. There's a time and a place for industrial. There's a time and a place for techno. There is a time and a place for Danzig. Not on the most distant moon of the Andromeda galaxy is there a time or a place for a half-assed mixture of all three. If you can peer through all the omnipresent fucky audio effects, Glenn Danzig still boasted a sane voice that was fully the fuck intact at this point in his career, which makes it all the more heinous and affront to waste it on a shit piece like this. Danzig 5 Black Acid Evil isn't bad because it's industrial. It's just bad industrial. Fuck the 90s and fuck this album. This is obviously a kind of a whole new Danzig yeah. band and everything. It's not true. Well, Joey's been in the band since 94. Yeah. That's five years. Joey? Well, I, well, he's been in the band since 96, so that's not so new. Well, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Hung up on let, biscuits and John Christ. Well, let me finish. Yeah, let me finish. come on in there. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Come on. <laughs> effort, Danzig, while ostensibly continuing in the late 90s industrial vein established on Black Acid Evil, stripped the fuck down, relegating the blaring factory beeps and boops to background noise and bringing the guitars front and center once again. The result? Proof positive that industrial Danzig was not a complete loss. Unfortunately, Glenn Danzig's voice didn't come along for the ride. After damn near two and a half decades of non-stop touring, the booming, vibrato-laden bellow of vintage Danzig had unfortunately withered to a hoarse whisper. And as his band was already moving that way to begin with, Glenn's solution 
was to slather it in 31 flavors of post-industrial distortion effects with a hands-down standout, fortunately, represented by yet another cover. A cover of a song that Glenn Danzig actually wrote to begin with. If that sounds confusing, well, maybe I should just leave it to the master to explain it. Take it away, Johnny Cash. I walked into Rick Rubin's living room to record one night, and there said a guy, and he said, John, this is Glenn. Glenn, this is John. The Glenn wrote a song for you, and I said, let's hear it. So he sang it. I liked it and started playing along with him, recorded it that night. And then after I finished that night, we were going home, he said his last name is Danzig. I said, hey, Glenn Danzig. Nice song. Bad luck wind been blowing on my back. I was born to bring trouble wherever I may have. And in a bit of pointless Metal Mythos related trivia, Danzig 666 was mixed by the great Cameron Webb, who fellow Rageaholics should recognize as the man who would go on to produce every Motorhead album since the almighty and highly recommended Inferno, which goes a long way to explaining why Danzig 6 seems to succeed in every way that his fifth seemed to fail spectacularly. If you dig the fuck out of some industrial metal, you could do much worse than Danzig 666, Satan's Child. Next! <laughs> After flirting with Industrial on Danzig 4 before Black Acid Evil, which saw Danzig dive into the genre waist-deep, which for Glenn Danzig is at least a good five inches, and making a much-needed correction for the far superior Danzig 666 Satan's Child, wasn't until 2002's seventh effort, I Luciferi, that the USS Danzig hit full sail on the seas of industrial metal, in the process cranking out a record that stands alongside like-minded efforts by other artists like the aforementioned Brutal Planet or Kill Fuck Die to at last legitimize the decision to imbibe in the genre in the first place. The problem? By 2002, industrial metal had all the unbridled commercial appeal of a Tabasco bikini wax. It's a great record, don't get me wrong, but the time to release it was in 2000. 2002, when the public had suddenly regained its appetite for classic metal of the 70s and 80s. The precise variety of anthemic, fist-pumping fare that the original lineup of Danzig had been at the vanguard of. The last thing anyone wanted to hear at that point was 90s backwash. Even good 90s backwash, like I, Luciferi. Best track? Probably the single, Kiss the Skull. Sure, it's somewhat generic, and that lead riff couldn't be any more Manson without missing two ribs and a Hitler haircut, but fuck if it isn't catchy, folks. Though it's worth mentioning that much of the latter half of the record is far more organic blues tinge metal in the vein of Danzig former repute, as exemplified by the slithering 70s groove of Naked Witch and the darksome doom metal of Without Light I Am. <laughs> that horse rasp of Latter-day Danzig, while slightly improved from the previous effort, is still very much in effect here. If you buy one album from Danzig's oft-lamented industrial era, make it Danzig 777, I Luciferic. Yeah, so we don't do these fucking things that often. I think the last time we were on TV was 1994, because most of these shows suck big dick. <laughs> By 2004, industrial and gothic rock were going the way of Jerry Only's hairline. On the silver lining front, whether it was Motorhead's Inferno or the reunion of Judas Priest, the formerly fallow climbs of 80s metal had suddenly become far more hospitable. It stands to reason that Danzig might have taken this as their cue to pony the fuck up and crank out an album that paid proper tribute to their early sound without losing sight of their musical future. And in that regard, Circle of Snakes 
almost fits the bill. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying here. With the introduction of guitarist Tommy Victor ushering in a new, more organic sound and the complete dismantling of the sputtering industrial dog shit of previous Danzig output, Circle of Snakes is an excellent album in its own right, but I can't honestly tell you it's quite the comeback Danzig needed to capitalize on the abruptly revitalized metal scene of 2004. But the most important comeback by far is Danzig's gradually regenerating vocal chords. I don't know if Glenn took some time off touring or gargled with Neosporin, but his voice, while not completely repaired, sounds considerably improved from the grating wheeze of Danzig 5 through 7. Snakes is the album Danzig 5 should have been. A torpid, doom-laden affair that progresses from the more somber, gothic affectations of Danzig 3 and 4, but lamentably not quite the album to re-establish the classic Danzig sound in 2004, but oh, we'll fucking get to that. Now, it was around this time that Glenn Danzig briefly pioneered yet another budding genre by emerging as one of the earliest YouTube stars, but it ain't what you think. No jump cuts, no cleavage camera angles, or fake womanly scream-laden Let's Plays for Heavy D. Sadly, this video helped make Glenn Danzig something more akin to infamous than famous. The word, not the eternally overrated game. Fast forward to 2015, you can scarcely utter the G sound in Glenn Danzig's name without some blathering half-wit proctomancer retort isn't that the guy who got knocked the fuck out on YouTube? At a gig, I believe, that was right here in Arizona. I think Glenn Danzig and a member of utter throwaway fat-ass core band, the Northside Kings, became embroiled in a disagreement about equipment being moved from the side of the stage, the details of which are spectacular in their irrelevance. On the face of it, Danzig pushes this man-tittied sea beast back, prompting the Asbury Doughboy to slug him one in self-defense. Down to the mat he goes for the TKO. Danzig seems like the prick who got what he deserved, a sentiment echoed ad nauseum by every chunder-brained encephalopath in the comments section of the aforementioned video. The problem? That's a kind of bullshit normally reserved for the body text of a Kotaku article. First off, what you don't see is that the Northside Kings, in a Kardashian-esque plea for attention, actually engineered this entire confrontation. See, this altercation was just one of several that had taken place on tour, with presumably a chorus of land whales continually provoking the notoriously short-tempered Danzig throughout, while keeping their camcorder conveniently handy, might I add, in an effort to build a name for themselves. In fact, if Danzig's word, not to mention the NorthsideKings.com watermark clearly visible on the bottom fifth of the screen wasn't enough of a clue for you to convict Colonel Mustard. After Danzig hits the linoleum, you actually catch a bit of evidence of this fact. You know, not to break this down like the fucking Zapruder film, but for all of Jabba the Hack's chest beating in the aftermath about how he boldly stood his ground, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with, and knocked out Glenn Danzig, anyone with eyeballs can clearly ascertain that as Danzig falls back and to the left, back and to the left, his head hasn't even made contact with the fucking ground before the cameraman looks up to discover... A fucking roadrunner cloud where Baron Von Bearclaw used to be. Well, there's that Sir Lancelot spirit. So wait, you get shoved once and decide to deck a guy roughly the size of one of your man boobs, and in the aftermath you birdie made off the fuck out of town with scarcely a what now, bitch? You've had bypasses longer than that fight, but you still feared for your life enough to change zip codes before a 50-year-old man is back on his feet, all in the name of defending the honor of your negative 12 fans? The only portage on it Woodstock isn't this full of shit. Fuck you directly in the skull, Northside Kings. You're obsessed with horror and assorted dark imagery. Would you ever do an album singing about, like, puppies and rainbows? Would that ever happen? Yeah. No, maybe I'll do a real horror record and talk about the Obama administration. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> so many new... It was a 
over a half decade before the next proper Danzig record, a lengthy drought during which we were treated to another Black Aria, as well as a bitchin' collection of unreleased material entitled The Lost Tracks of Danzig. Passable appetizers, but it was half past time for the main fucking course, and when 2010 hit, the arrival of Death Red Sabaoth did not disappoint. One of the sleaziest, dong dangling doom metal Danzig records that will ever penetrate your virginal ear holes, with Death Red Sabaoth representing the finest Danzig records since four, and maybe even three, isolating a standout track as a Herculean endeavor. But from the first moment I heard it, I could not shake the sublime 70s sleaze of the voodoo anthem Juju Bone, ready-made with a music video featuring every solitary one of Danzig's gratuitous, cock-thrusting conceits from exploding skulls to heaving silicone titties. Put in a hill, Break you up a little sound Come on, GG And folks, for all the shit I see Danzig getting online for the unpardonable crime of fucking aging, this album features one of the finest vocal performances of the man's ever-living career. Gone is the industrial smoker's hiss of Danzig 6 and 7. Death Red Sabaoth is the sound of Glenn Danzig lifting the finger to father time and unleashing the full mountain-flattening power of his booming baritone. Proof positive that rumors of the death of Danzig's pipes were greatly fucking exaggerated. Black candy! And he doesn't stop there, playing bass on every track and even marking the first time Glenn Danzig has played a drum track since the Sam Hain masterpiece, November Coming Fire. Wait, tracks? Fuck all. Whatever my initial appraisal, folks, the longer it lives with me, the closer I come to placing Death Red Sabaoth above Danzig 4 in my personal pantheon. Resounding recommendation. Well, that does it, folks, for this atramentous appraisal of the unparalleled discography of the legendary Danzig. I hope you enjoyed it, and until I next emerge from the ethereal mists of the metal mythos, I'm Razor Fist. God fucking speed. <laughs>